Let's talk a little bit about 15th century armour in context. Did it make people invulnerable? And why did they sometimes not wear as much armour as they could have done? Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatore. Hopefully you recognised me inside uh, all of this. Obviously I'm not wearing my full harness, I've just stuck a salad and a bever on for illustrative purposes. But what we're going to look at in this video is the topic of fully armoured men-at-arms, particularly in the 15th century, although you could apply this to the 14th and the 16th as well. So the, the kind of um, glorious period of full plate armour that's often studied by people doing things like HEMA and lots of reenactment. Um, We've got the Hundred Years' War, the Wars of the Roses, the Fall of Constantinople, all lots of interesting things going on. Um, but one of the common misconceptions is that people wearing armour were always like almost invulnerable to hand weapons because they wore full armour. And what I want to break down in this video is why sometimes people chose, not necessarily just by necessity from economics or because they weren't a knight or whatever, uh, but they actually chose to not wear full armour and why that was the case. What you gain from not wearing certain specific pieces and what the vulnerabilities are of armour, be it at the full level and indeed if you remove certain pieces. But before I go on, I'm going to remove some of this because I want to talk to you about our sponsors for this video. And the first piece to come off is the Bever, and I'll be talking about Bevers a little bit later in this video. But first of all, as I say, let's talk about our sponsors who are Surfshark. Now, we all like to stay safe in numerous different ways, whether it's putting your seatbelt on or wearing a mask in the current pandemic in order to travel to work, or indeed, whether it's that you elect to wear a Bever with your salad on the medieval battlefield. And our sponsors, Surfshark, are the VPN who like to help keep you safe as well in your online life. Now, if you're a regular internet user, you probably know all about Surfshark, you've probably heard of them, and you know that they're a VPN. If you don't know what VPN stands for, it's a virtual private network, which is a kind of armour for internet users. Surfshark is one of the biggest, most well-known and reputable VPNs around, and it helps you access the internet safely from anywhere in the world, just as safely as if you were at home or in your castle. And even if you're at home, it makes internet browsing and internet use safer as well. So what does Surfshark help you do? Well, for one thing, it helps you protect your ID and if needs be, disguise it. It gives you greater security when browsing the web or streaming media, or indeed when gaming. G2, you can block automated ads, you can block malware, of course, and indeed pop-ups as well. You can also bypass geographic restrictions, if of course you're allowed to in the country which you're operating in. Something else which is really great about Surfshark is they provide 24-7 help if you need it. So if you want to experience a more consistent internet experience wherever you are in the world, and indeed have more control over how the internet affects you and how you interact with it, why not try Surfshark today? Use my code below, Scholar Gladiatoria, of course, to get 83% off and an extra three months for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it yourself. Once again, you can find the link in the description right below this video. So thanks for staying with me, and now back to the main content of this video. So um, oftentimes in HEMA, particularly in HEMA I have to say, you see this idea which stems from the treatises that we study, where you have unarmoured and you have armoured, okay? And very clearly, when someone is wearing full plate harness, head to foot, they are a very, very tough opponent to overcome. They have relatively few openings you can exploit. And because there's this almost black and white contrast in a lot of the treatises that we look at between unarmoured, in other words, civilian kind of dueling scenario stuff, or street fighting self-defence, and then armoured fighting, could be dueling, or it could be a knightly duel, or it could be battlefield one-on-one -on -one stuff. Um, but either way, you have this unarmoured and armoured contrast. I think a lot of people have the idea that if there's armour, involved then you have kind of not an insurmountable challenge but you have a, a, an opponent that is very very difficult to overcome which is true but almost that they're invulnerable so the first thing to say is that armor no type of armor no type of armor ever invented certainly in the medieval and renaissance eras makes a person invulnerable it just reduces their vulnerability or increases their survivability on the battlefield. It's just the same as modern um, mechanized warfare. You can have the most high-tech piece of equipment in the world, like a stealth fighter, 
which can still be shot down by a hand, um, handheld, uh, simple weapon uh, if, with a bit of luck, with a stroke of luck. And it's just the same in 15th century warfare. Even the knight wearing the best quality armour of the day, head to foot, um, equipped with the best horse and everything else, can of course still be brought down by a lucky or unlucky, depending which side you're on, um, kind of you know shot or blow or whatever. But there are some key vulnerabilities, which probably a lot of viewers of this channel are very familiar with, um, for someone who's wearing complete harness. The key vulnerabilities are the facial opening, okay? So as you saw here, I was previously wearing this uh, Bever and Salad, um, but the simple fact is that most helmets have a way of opening or they have a vision slot or they have a, 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 sometimes a fully open face or sometimes they have some kind of gaps or articulations at the neck. A lot of types of helmet have something on the face which can be exploited. One thing which a lot of people aren't aware of is that most visors, um, certainly before the mid to late 15th century, didn't have any form of locking mechanism. So uh, even a, um, a, a pig, so-called hunskull or pig-faced bassinet, for example, it has a male avantail. The male may be able to be compromised, but the visor can literally be lifted. They didn't have locking mechanisms on them. Um, Locking mechanisms did come along later, uh, but they weren't universal either. Um, and of course you have uh, vision slots. So clearly there are places, there are always going to be places, either where you put the helmet on and off or to see or to breathe or open the visor or whatever, that can be compromised. And we see this in the treatises being exploited. Uh, in one of the earliest treatises we have, in Fiore, we have the bassinet visor being lifted up and a stab being put into the face or even a gauntleted um, fist. Um, so the helmet can be compromised and you could extrapolate that to any other bit of armour in terms of pulling it aside, wrenching it, um, opening it, this kind of thing. And for example, um, in Paulos Cal, we see a rondel dagger being used to cut the um, arming point that connects the spolder um, in order to get uh, into the fleshy parts under or mailed parts underneath the plate. So you can compromise the armour in that way. Another way you can compromise it, and this is particularly applicable to heads, and we see this in treatises, is to basically hit the person so hard with something that they get injured inside the armour anyway. And again, we see this in Fury with a poleaxe, uh, where the poleaxe is such a powerful striking weapon that the um, person is advised to just hit the person three times in the head. If hitting them three times in the head doesn't knock them out or give them concussion or break their neck or something, then he says you drop the pole axe, grab them by the visor and pull them to the ground, wrestle them basically to the ground. Um, and of course you could, uh, you could link it up with other techniques shown in that treatise. You could just open the visor and start um, mashing into the hole. So there are ways you can offend someone through the armour with a very heavy hitting thing like a pole axe or a halberd. Um, or indeed a, a gun, um, if, if that's available in the time and place where you're looking at, um, or you can remove the thing. But there are also some gaps in full plate harness, and the key ones to note, apart from the face that I've just talked about, are armpits, inside of the elbows, so obviously both um, elbows, armpits, uh, groin, backs of the knees and sometimes the ankles. Now this is assuming a person is plated from head to foot, but you have to remember that those gaps will have something in them. They're not usually just flesh. Um, in the best case scenario, there's mail. So there is chain mail armor, which if it's well made, is very, very resistant, especially to hand weapons, things like daggers and swords. So even in those gaps, you have still hopefully got mail. Now it must be admitted, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. In some cases, you don't have mail in those gaps, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, now, that's assuming a full plate harness. And what we have to concede, and really the purpose of this video, is to point out that lots of people in the 15th century who could have worn full plate harness chose not to for various reasons. You all know, if you're a certainly if you're a regular viewer of this channel, but I suspect that a lot of you uh, even who aren't regular viewers of this channel would know and realise that armour comes at a cost, not just at a financial cost, but at a cost of weight, heat um, and um, uh, fatigue um, and restriction to movement. And it comes at a cost in terms of your effectiveness on the battlefield. Now, those things are 
in many ways outweighed by the things you gain from wearing armor and that is the ability to be hit by numerous different weapons many many times and basically be fine so on balance the advantages of wearing full plate harness of good quality outweigh the disadvantages but we shouldn't ignore the disadvantages and we must remember that in some specific contexts and scenarios or even down to personal preference sometimes some of those disadvantages are not worth um, not worth suffering essentially okay so one of the common things is we sometimes see if we look in medieval art we see people who are really quite well armored on the tops of their bodies but wear almost no armor sometimes no armor at all they're literally just wearing hose almost like stockings uh, on their legs now if you're thinking about a one-on-one -on -one dueling scenario this seems absolutely insane because why would you armor your upper half and then leave your bottom half completely vulnerable anyone who does hema knows that it, certainly if you're both wearing armor it's pretty easy to hit someone in the legs and if the person's got no armor there well, it doesn't matter how much armor they've got on their top half you just chop their leg off or wound them in the thigh hit their artery bleeding everywhere dead person okay so one-on-one -on -one, that would seem insane and yeah it would be stupid but on a battlefield it's a completely different situation firstly a lot of these people not wearing leg armor are in large groups of people if you're in a large group of people your legs are essentially hidden uh, because you're squished in with a load of other people all wearing armor and the only things really which are going to be hit by weapons being uh, swung like this or even thrust in many cases swung down or arrows or crossbow bolts stones um, even bullets in some situations coming raining down shrapnel coming down only the top half is actually going to be hit by those things and the legs are protected by virtue of the fact that you're squished in not only that but you gain some things so it's not just a case of not having to wear armor on the legs because you could say well i don't have to but it's still good protection so i'm going to do it anyway but you, what you gain from not wearing armor on your legs is your legs are now more nimble they're lighter potentially more comfortable you can uh, perhaps hop on and off horses more easily and climb up things climb over banks more stable perhaps in um, swamps and muddy muddy areas um, climbing up ladders this kind of stuff so there are all sorts of agility and stamina benefits to not wearing uh, armor on your legs okay um, there are other parts of the body which sometimes they took armor off so one of those was the arms we sometimes see people in full plate harness but with just male and usually gauntlets but sometimes not even gauntlets on the arms well again it's about maneuverability lightness quickness so depending on the type of combat you're involved in you might find that you think well male sleeves which bear in mind work very well for knights for hundreds of years before plate armor was invented especially if you've got a degree of padding under the mail um, generally speaking if you're wearing mail under plate you don't want padding underneath it but if you're wearing mail by itself you do want padding underneath it so remember the arming clothes that you wear under the armor might differ depending on what armor setup you're going for so if you're intending to wear a cuirass plate cuirass but only have male arms you might wear an arming doublet which has padded arms whereas if you're intending to put plate arms on you want them to be close fitting and well articulated you'll probably go for an arming doublet which has no padding on the arms at all um, so different setups and you can't always see all of the armor that's involved in the complete um, uh, outfit um, if you want to call it that so sometimes they went for male arms uh, sometimes they neglected to wear gauntlets which again if you're thinking about one-on-one -on -one hema anyone who does long sword or sword and buckler sparring you imagine well oh today i just won't wear my gloves crazy insane but on a battlefield again it's a different situation if you need your dexterity if you need your hands to be able to operate a bow maybe load um, siege engines climb up ladders whatever you have to do even riding a horse to some extent mitten gauntlets are, are not famously not that great for, for horse riding for example it's one reason why some people might choose fingered gauntlets over uh, mitten gauntlets um, using a couch lance this kind of thing um, but there are many reasons why you might choose to have greater dexterity with your hand at the cost of protection and the same goes for the full arms we even see um, in some cases a example of people in full plate harness just taking individual pieces off such as just taking the pauldrons off now pauldrons are hugely protective and they look super cool anyone who likes warhammer 40k i'm sure loves the idea of large 
big Milanese pauldrons or something like this. And they do look awesome. But when you use them, you realize they come at a cost. Not only is a big plate heavier, um, but a big plate also restricts your movement more. Now, yes, whilst very well-made um, originals and very good quality replicas restrict you less than poor quality ones, you've got to remember not all armor uh, necessarily was of the best quality in period, and not all armor necessarily fitted the person perfectly. Some armor was hand-me-down armor or borrowed armor. In fact, we even know about armors which were borrowed or loaned for, for duels even, for knightly combats, judicial duels. But Anyway, if you have shoulder protection on, the bigger the shoulder protection is, the more it restricts your movement of your arms here. And if, for example, you're lightly skirmishing or indeed you're fighting in a one-on-one -on -one duel, um, uh, and we see this in Fiore, you might go for smaller shoulder protection and take off the pauldrons and just rely on the male sleeves, because you've still got mail there underneath, chain mail. Um, if you take those pauldrons off, suddenly you've got greater degree of mobility with the shoulders, you can move your sword quicker, you're not carrying so much weight up here. So you can move your weapons quicker, you can maybe get arm locks, um, arm bars, you can wrestle a bit better, um, you can get your arm closer to your helmet. Pauldrons tend to clash with the helmet if you bring them up here. If you've got a projecting helmet and you've got a projecting pauldron, you get to a certain point where you can't move the arm any further, so there's some advantages to removing it. Um, so uh, there are many, many reasons why, and coming back to the bever, there are many, many reasons why you might want to remove things. And during the Wars of the Roses, we repeatedly hear about people, some people who we know could afford the best level of armor of, of the day being wounded in the face. Why were they wounded in the face, you think? Well, weren't they wearing their bever with their visor down? Clearly, no, they weren't. Uh, clearly, they uh, were trying to get some breath or trying to see a bit better or hear what their mate was shouting at them. Many, many people in the 15th century, despite the fact that this helmet is designed to be worn with this bever, many people didn't like wearing these bevers, it seems, both from written evidence and from uh, artistic evidence, and they took them off. You take this off, you're now exposed here. But often under my videos about armour, people look at armoured figures in art or me wearing armour and say, oh, you've got a gap there, you've got a gap there, you've got, gap. You've got loads of gaps, okay? You can never wear a complete armour that doesn't have gaps in it. And remember that even if you cover all the gaps in metal somehow, if you look at like Henry VIII's tournament armour, there are still ways you can offend the person through the armour. You can still wrestle them to the ground, you can still, you can still break their joints and do nasty things to them, jujitsu style. You can still there are still going to be some gaps somewhere that you can stab into. And remember, if you're using a weapon like a poleaxe or a two-handed sword, then you can just hit them so hard that regardless, they're going to get injured. And um, this is mentioned, in fact, when we look at Henry VIII's um, uh, back and forth with the King of France for the Field of Cloth of Gold tournament. And they were going to have a fight with long sword, where, sorry, with two-handed swords. And there's this famous statement saying, well, we, you know, we don't have gauntlets strong enough to stand up to the two-handed swords, so let's just not do it. <laughs> um, so even then, even with the best armourers of the day, they thought that they couldn't make gauntlets to really make their hands really safe enough to make this a, a, a viable option for the tournament. So remember, 15th century armour, whilst it could be fully encapsulating pretty much and have minimal gaps, even that person who's wearing that best armour, you can still overcome them in a variety of ways, usually wrestling, number one, stabbing in gaps, number two, or hitting them so hard with something big that they get wounded or knocked out anyway, okay, or just overwhelming them. I'd kind of put this in the wrestling category, but overwhelming them, so getting several people who might not have any armour just to jump on them and take them down to the ground, get their helmet off, stab them, okay, that's always an option. Um, so, but lots of people who could have worn that full armour didn't wear that full armour and decided deliberately to neglect certain coverage, whether it was having an open face, taking their bever off, having uh, no pauldrons to give better shoulder mobility, wearing no leg armour to get better leg mobility and perhaps speed, running around, all that kind of stuff, um, taking plates off the arms and just having male sleeves instead to have better mobility of the arms and be a bit lighter and quicker. All sorts of reasons. So, armour of the 15th century was very much a modular thing, okay? And it could be it could be 100%, it could be 80%, 70%, could be all the way down to 0% if you couldn't afford it, of course. But even people who could afford the 100% didn't always wear the 100%. Sometimes they chose, for specific reasons, to wear 75%. 
I hope that's been useful for you. Check out the links below um, and thanks again to our sponsors from Surfshark. Um, stay safe, wear your bever, don't get an arrow in the face. Cheers for watching and I'll see you again soon for another video. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.